Hello and welcome to the 15th annual George A. Roper Festival of Senior Projects. At a first meeting with prospective families, I always describe the experience here at Roper to be one where students have the opportunity to discover and pursue their own passions. They are handed the reins, encouraged to try new things and find what they love, essentially carve and explore their own pathways. A core tenet of the Roper philosophy reminds us that we should allow students to participate in the shaping of their own destinies. Senior projects at Roper are by no means required, but viewed as capstone projects that students choose to engage in. They've chosen to embark on this independent journey and then share their findings and creative energies with you, their community. And so here we are. I'm very proud of this group of artists, athletes, actors, writers, scientists, philanthropists, and musicians. They're a young group with an already long story to tell, full of experiences that have shaped who they are today. I hope that when they talk about their days at Roper and their days growing up in a school that has afforded them opportunities to explore anything and everything, they'll fondly remember this experience, just as we will fondly remember them. Thank you again for joining us this evening to celebrate the class of 2021 and their exceptional, very important work. Enjoy. Okay. Interior, Elsinore, office, late morning. Hamlet and Horatio are in a small office. Horatio is pacing back and forth while Hamlet prepares for his match. We need a plan. They're obviously going to try to kill you, perhaps me as well. What are you gonna do? Lex, I'm great at fencing. Laertes doesn't stand a chance. You're right, that ego should protect you. Seriously, I can't imagine that fencing is the best way to murder someone. So how else would you do it? Shoot them, poison them? I don't know, I haven't exactly studied how to kill someone. It's kind of a miracle you haven't killed, murdered anyone yet. You know, I would have believed it. Believed what? That you killed Polonius. With the state you've been in, I would have believed you went bananas and killed him. Horatio, did you just say bananas when referring to murder? I think this investigation has gotten to you far more than I anticipated. I don't know if I should be hurt or flattered that you think I'm strong enough to go on a murder spree. If Claudius and Gertrude have proven anything, it's that strength has nothing to do with it. All right, then I'm just hurt. I had chances to murder them, but did I? No, I've waited till we had proof and could catch them in the act. Not to mention they're totally going to try and kill us, so anything we do, self-defense. I'm not sure that's how it works. Besides, why shouldn't I kill them? They killed our friends, our family. An eye for an eye and all that, you know? I have a feeling poison is the way they're going to go. Don't drink anything they give you. Noted. Well, you've kept them long enough, shall we? Interior, Elsinore, throne room, late morning. Horatio opens the door, and he and Hamlet join Claudius, Gertrude, and Laertes in the throne room. Hmm. Welcome. I'm glad we can settle our agreements like civilized men instead of that display at the funeral. Laertes, Hamlet, when you are ready. Claudius whispers something into Laertes' ear as he steps forward to meet Hamlet in the vast open room. Hamlet does not say anything to Horatio before meeting Laertes in the middle of the room. Thank you for accepting my challenge. I didn't have anything else planned today. Seemed like a good, good waste of time. Uh, the two start the match. Hamlet seems to be winning, but then I can't read my own reading. Hamlet seems to be winning, but then Laertes gets a hit in on Hamlet. Hamlet, angry, starts to just attack Laertes. It briefly turns to a fist fight. In that moment, the swords switch. Hamlet with Laertes' sword and Laertes with Hamlet's. A moment, please. Let's take a breather. Hamlet? 
Sounds good to me. If you insist. Hamlet joins Horatio while Larity sulks in the corner. Any reason for the pause? Aside that, from the fact that you started a fist fight again? No, not exactly. But I would like to know what they are planning. I was so sure something was going to happen. Perhaps we were wrong. Maybe this is truly just Lairdies being Lairdies. I hope you are right. Well then, back at it you go. Don't worry, it'll be fine. Famous last words if I've ever heard them. Lairdies and Hamlet go to continue their fight. I believe that's mine. We must have switched swords in the fight. Can I have it back? I don't see why you should need it. I think we should just finish the match. Hamlet, seriously, give me back my sword. It's just the hill you want to die on. Yep. Larrities grabs at the sword. Hamlet takes the grab as an attack and stabs Larrities. What the hell? Sorry, just expecting someone to murder me today. Oh, you're a little too late for that one. What? The sword, it was poisoned. And it switched hands, so we have both been stabbed. Oh, that's not good. Horatio! Horatio runs to Hamlet and Larrities. While they talk, Gertrude hands Claudius a drink. He seems genuinely worried. She's probably just trying to calm him down. So, now both of us are dying. I told you this was a terrible idea. Larrities, who poisoned the sword? Do, do you have gave, the antidote? Claudius gave me the sword. I don't know how to fix the poison. Why did he poison me? Because you caused Ophelia's death and murdered my father. For the last time, I didn't kill your father. And Ophelia didn't kill herself. She was murdered. By Gertrude, no less. Liar. There's no way. I can prove it to you, but we don't have time for it right now. Hamlet, are you feeling well enough to go find the antidote? I can just go ask Claudius. Claudius falls to the floor, dead. Never mind. Laertes, you didn't happen to stab Claudius, did you? I don't think so. It was Hamlet. He poisoned Claudius. Laertes, don't listen to their lies. They have been conspiring for weeks on end to kill all of us who stand in their way to the throne. Don't listen to her. She's lying. She's lying and you know it. Of course, obviously. I'll bet that you knew Laertes was dying and spilling the beans to your plan. The next to spill would be Claudius, wouldn't it? I swear you'll come up with any lie or kill anyone to cover your tracks. Hamlet, how could you spread such lies about your own mother? I could never. Right, maybe Claudius dropped dead of his own accord, because I certainly wasn't given the chance to do him in myself. I was busy flighting the man flying, dying on the floor next to me. Seems likely. We all know Claudius was prone to dying. You think that idiot could have done something simple as dying without my help? No, I don't think he could have. Laertes, listen. They only want the throne. Can't you see? They killed your father and freeing me to confuse you and your sister's loyalties. You must understand that it's up to you to stop them from bringing tyranny down on our home. Laertes, struggling to get up, raises Hamlet's sword in a last-ditch attempt to stop his enemies. Gertrude rises and walks closer to Laertes. Laertes, think about this seriously. Why did we want this? Hamlet is in line for the throne. He doesn't need to murder his way to the top. Laertes, you must now understand fully, like I have, who is trying to kill me. At first we thought it was Hamlet, but now I see it was Horatio who has turned Hamlet into a pawn of his own. Kill him, and we may yet be able to save the prince from further tragedy. I see. I will defend you, my lady. Laertes lunges at Horatio and gets a cursory hit in before crumpling to the floor, death looming over him. I do not care for the throne. Never have, never will. I want justice for the people she has killed. Laertes, please, I wish you no harm, but your queen will send you to your death to stall from her own. Let us help you. Do you have the antidote? Why would one keep the antidote when trying to kill someone? And you call yourselves detectives. Don't you see? She doesn't care. If she had the antidote, she would surely give it to you. Now you are standing between her and the throne. I swear we never hurt your sister or your father. Their deaths are on your queen's hands alone. You and Claudius were just pawns in her game. 
A long silent fall silence falls over the group as Larrities ponders the many accusations being yelled at him. Larrities once again is struck by death's approach. Larrities grabs Hamlet's hand. I think I'm starting to understand what's going on here. I think I've been played for the biggest fool. It's okay. We'll get you out of here and then you can apologize properly once you feel better. Horatio catches Hamlet's attention and nods to Larrities. Larrities is dead. That is when we realized we were in trouble. Hamlet, we need to go. No, I'm not leaving. She's caused the deaths of so many. She tried to have Laertes kill you. I cannot let her go free. Hamlet, no. Hamlet runs at Gertrude and stabs her. Why did you do it? We'll never know what it's like. Being surrounded by fools. Don't know the first thing about anything. I know so much. I deserve to rule. No one would give me my power, so I took it. All this for power? Why did so many people have to die? Polonius was a better use dead than alive. If Ophelia hadn't figured it out, you would have all been stopped in your tracks. It's a shame I had to kill her. She seemed like a smart girl. She was. If it weren't for her, we would never have figured out your treachery. The only thing I regret is not trying to kill Horatio sooner. Now a witness will be left. I covered my track so well. I was just going to let Claudius take the blame, but no. You got in my way. <laughs> my own son has killed me. Richard tries to free herself from the sword so she may die dramatically, but Hamlet grabs her to keep her from dying. I have one last question before I let you die here. Was it always you? Did you kill my father? That was your uncle. About the only useful thing he ever did. I just picked up the pieces left by him. But did you tell him to do it? Gertrude just smiles and then dies. Horatio, I don't feel so well. I think the, po I think the poison. Sit me down, will you? Horatio and Hamlet sit on the floor amongst the dead bodies. We'll figure this out. It will be fine. My dear Horatio, no use lying. Not a child. I can feel myself slipping. Ever the dramatic. I was hoping I'd feel better once we got revenge. But you don't. That's generally the thing stories warn us about. No, I feel pretty content with Gertrude and Claudius being dead. I had just gotten used to living life together with you. Don't you start. Don't fucking start. I will not have that from you. I'm a dying man. I'm allowed to be emotional on my deathbed, goddammit. Don't leave me, Hamlet. If you leave, I'll surely follow. Now, don't you start. You have to stay alive and tell everyone what happened. Tell them the tragic story that led to all our deaths. Will you do that for me? Only you would die and ask someone to live to immortalize you. Yes, I'll tell everyone what happened. Good, good. Horatio, I love you. I love you too. Horatio kissed, kisses Hamlet, and then Hamlet dies, and it's just tragic and sad. The end. Hello, everyone. I'm Clyde, and I'm going to be talking a bit about my senior project, which was writing a fantasy novel. Now, what was the project? It initially began as a pastime where I'd do world building for fun. I started seriously writing the book during the second semester of my junior year, as part of an independent study with Dan Jacobs. It turned into a full project my senior year. I have currently written about 100 single-spaced Microsoft Word pages worth of the book and plan to continue writing it even after school ends. So, what is the book about? 
The book is written as a collection of letters, journal entries, poems, songs, and folklore used to tell the story and highlight the cultures of the world. It focuses on a small cast of characters whose viewpoints and observations shape the focus of the plot. There are two primary characters, Liznan and Turan. Turan is a harvester, which is essentially a combination between a monk and a doctor, who slowly discovers the interconnectedness of the world he lives in and seeks to share that connection with those around him. Liznan is destined to one day take her mother's place as the leader of her homeland and dedicates herself to keeping her home safe and helping to foster peace with nearby civilizations. The story follows both of them growing up, discovering more about the world, and eventually having to step up as protectors of the homeland they love. So just to give you a bit of a sample of uh, the writing, I have a poem and a lullaby from one of the cultures, so I'm going to read them real quick. Uh, the first one is the poem called The One Below. A child slumbers beneath the earth, its warped abode, a home and hearth, devoid of thought, yet endless it dreams of all that there is, was, and will be. Nurtured by void, the source of all string, it rests as it hears the lullabies we sing. In peace and contentment, one day we'll go, singing our song to the one deep below. And then here is the lullaby. Walk amongst the dreams of old, sweet, tired child of mine, for nature takes you in its arms, cradles you till end of time. Listen to the whispering songs made to bring you peace, for I sing them till dying breath to see your burdens eased. Grow and see the joyful world with wonders held in life, and no more feel your pain and fear, for I shall take your strife. So, moving on, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the lessons I have learned while writing. Now, the first one I learned was that creating a story can come from literally anywhere. A lot of stories start out as a single idea that grows and expands in scope until it becomes a full story. Mine started out as a general love of fantasy from Dungeons & Dragons and my rediscovery of the soundtrack from Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Sky that combined with a desire to make a Lovecraft-style cosmic horror deity that was benevolent after seeing so many evil or ambivalent ones. So, there you go, my two muses, Explorers of Sky and Cthulhu, and also elephants. De definitely elephants. Elephants are definitely featured in this story. Now, the next lesson I learned is that the scope of your story is going to shift the more your ideas start to form. What I mean by this is that while you're starting to figure out what you want to actually write about, you're going to shift the exact details of it. Uh, pantheons might change gods, civilizations might pop into or out of existence to further your exploration, or maybe your characters might have something different for breakfast. Basically, don't feel beholden to one vision. Write what feels best to you, and then edit it all to help it flow a bit better. As, as you can see here, the ultimate choice, apples or oranges for the breakfast. Choose wisely, writers. Now, the next thing I learned is that world building is first and foremost fun. When I started out writing the book, I would go onto the internet and look up pe different people's perspectives on how to make a culture. I started seeing two noticeable extremes, either describing every last bit of lore and making it as comprehensive as possible, or avoiding giving any explanation for anything like the plague out of fear of boring your readers. Uh, here's my personal recommendation if you want to make a world. Go for it. Give detail to every last thing you care about while you're still formulating the setting of your story. Then, when you're all set to start writing the actual plot, you have the freedom to take or leave whatever there is, based on whether you think it enhances or distracts from your overall creation. Making worlds is really fun. Like, seriously, world building is possibly one of the most enjoyable parts of writing. So don't ever feel pressured to adhere to either of these extremes. This leads me into my next which is to have some confidence in yourself. I think this is good advice for life in general, but it has a specific application with regards to writing. There's a lot of people out there who will tell you what a story has to include and exclude, what is novel and what is cliche, what will be vital and catastrophic in your quest to make something. Here's the thing. All this advice will do is instruct you on how to create their perfect story, not your own. There is not a thing wrong with taking inspiration from some of their talking points, but don't ever feel beholden to their way of telling a story. If you feel something they advocate wouldn't gel with what you're trying to make, you're probably right. This is by no means saying ignore all criticism, just that you should use the filter of what would help enhance your story and what might distract from it. Now, 
Next lesson I learned is that communication is important, especially with those you're sharing your story with and seeking feedback from. Ask for feedback based on what areas of the book you want to strengthen to help get a better grasp of what you're doing well at and what you need to improve on. Also, give the person a heads up as to what kind of story you're trying to tell. People often have different tastes when it comes to what sort of stories they enjoy, so letting them know what it is up front will help handle any tonal clash between your story and their tastes. Additionally, if someone has something they want to talk about that's outside the initial scope of the criticism, hear them out. They could point out a glaring flaw you might not have seen or potentially appreciate something in your writings you didn't notice. Also, just a quick shout out to my senior project advisor, editor, beta reader, and fellow lover of fantasy, Dan Jacobs. Seriously, Dan, thank you. And thank you for listening to my many, many rants. <laughs> now, the next lesson I learned is that the world is interesting. So when I was writing the novel, I ended up doing a lot of research from the history of paper development to the usage of spider silks as a way to accelerate healing to the intelligence of crows and ravens. Sometimes I'd use the information I found, other times I wouldn't. Either way, I never felt like I wasted my time because it was fun to find out more about the world we live in. Seriously, we live on a planet filmed to the brim with locales and organisms that each have something that distinguishes them. And that's not even getting into the variation of cultures, histories, discoveries, and ideas our own species has created. Writing basically gave me an excuse to explore that planet, and I think it helped me appreciate the world we live in a little bit more. Now, a little bit sim similar to my last point, the world is how we perceive it. Specifically in the realm of fantasy and any other media where you shape the world, what I mean by this is that you have control over how everything works. Realism is a lot like salt. It can add some flavor and enjoyability to what you make, but you should take care to only use the amount you're comfortable with putting on. Uh, forced food metaphors aside, what I mean is that you're totally free to accentuate, ignore, or alter parts of our own world in your journey to make your own. For example, when I made humans in my world, I tried to make most of them kind, thoughtful, and deeply empathetic people with varying degrees of nihilism about the world who genuinely want to help those around them and live in peace. I'll leave how much that concept of humanity adheres to realism up to you all. We're basically more than 7 billion unique lenses all staring at the same abyss filled with everything inside of it and each seeing something different. Now. This last one is probably one of the most important lessons I learned from writing. I think we can all agree that the past two years have been really difficult. We've seen, heard of, or felt a lot of awful stuff, and it can often feel overwhelming, like it's all we can think about. I think that for a while I kind of lost myself in that. I found it increasingly difficult to feel a lot of the joy I used to. Successes felt short-lived and hollow, losses felt cataclysmic and inescapable, and I'd consider it a good day if I was able to get half an hour free of worrying about imaginary dangers and failures of the present and future. Even as the world finally seemed to be getting better, it was still difficult to scrub out a lot of that negativity, no matter how much evidence I saw to the contrary. I had lost sight of myself, and all I knew was that I hated the bitter thing that took up the entire lens. So I continued writing. I took a break from all of that negativity that seemed to basically always be there gnawing at the back of my mind and immersed myself in a place where I could explore concepts of wonder, healing, joy, and hope. There was something transformative about that for me. Exploring those concepts sort of helped me find them within myself and the world once again. The fact that I was able to write them and feel them as I did so showed me that I hadn't lost them, and once I regained the slightest sliver of that connection to those concepts, I drew upon it. Slowly but surely, I felt myself able to overcome the negativity that had once been insurmountable. I could enjoy those small moments of kindness or happiness or hope. I could feel things getting better. Writing basically paved the way for a small personal motto I'm trying to live by, which is stop drinking vinegar, partake in honey. There are and always have been good, friendly, beautiful things in this world, and they're what make life worth living. I learned that you can accomplish a lot more protecting and growing what you love than you can trying to destroy what you hate, and you'll be able to enjoy life a lot more. Everything painful and evil is finite, so all that matters is enduring and making sure the good things in this world are not only protected, but also cherished and spread. I know that might sound cliche, but like I said before, I stopped paying attention to what was considered cliche fairly early in on writing the story. Now, I have one last, final secret lesson for you all. 
Writing takes a long time, but every moment of it is a worthwhile experience. Like I mentioned before, I still have a ways to go before I finish the book, but I plan to continue working on it this summer and beyond. So thank you all so much for watching my presentation, and I hope you all have a great day. Hi everyone, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Meredith Grecken, and today I will be talking about my senior project Detroit term, a class in which I wrote a curriculum for. The class is a hands-on experimental learning experience, where students will not only learn about Detroit from a classroom, but also from being in the city itself. But before I get into exactly what Detroit term is, I first have to take you guys back to my junior year first semester when I attended a program called City Term. So what was City Term? City Term was a semester school that I attended in New York. I lived at the master school in Dobbs Ferry, New York and, commi and commuted into the city three to four times a week, which was about a 40 minute train ride. So my City Term experience. It was one of those life changing experiences. It was one of the best experiences of my life. I know I'm 17 years old, so what do I, what have I really lived yet? But out of the 17 years, it has been one of the best experiences. I truly came back with a whole new outlook on city living and really the whole process of running a city and what goes into that. I made lifelong friends that I still talk to every day. I learned to look more clearly through my own eyes. And my writing skills improved dramatically, which I know all of my Roper teachers appreciated a lot. So to show you a little bit of what City Term look like, looked like, um, here is a collage of some pictures. These pictures were taken all over New York City. Um, some are from the Brooklyn Bridge, One World Trade Center, Chinatown, um, uh, Soho, you name it, it, I was there. Um, and this is a city term logo. So sit, when city term ended, it was a tough process, but I had loved every single second of it and cherished every memory. But not only did city term help me gain an understanding of New York and myself, but it also made me look at the city that's not that far um, from where I was living as well, aka Detroit. Um, so it made me see Detroit also as a city I want to explore, but I had the idea of Detroit term sort of before I even left from city term. I just wanted to, you know, make sure it was what I wanted to do. So to do that, you know, city term, let's do Detroit term. And I um, created the name on the spot one day when I was leaving city term and I raced down and I told um, the head of our program, he was like, I love it. Um, so then literally maybe a couple weeks after I got back, I was like to my parents, I was like, let's go down to Detroit. I want to explore Detroit. I already miss exploring the city. And they were like, okay. So for my brother's 18th birthday, we went to the apparatus room, which totally gave me city term vibes in the sense that um, the restaurant actually used to be um, an old firehouse and it has very industrial vibes to it. The food was amazing. I felt like I was in this, city that you know is really not that far from me but yet was completely new um and then when I got home I was curious how far my dad drove so I put it in and I was like oh my gosh I can totally do this drive it's so close um and then over the summer I was getting super excited about Detroit term and we were boating one day and I was like wow the New York the Detroit skyline is so pretty it even almost competes with the New York skyline. And honestly, they're both beautiful, and I love both of them. But I was excited to explore Detroit and all of the new nooks and crannies it had to offer. 
Um, so moving on, the Detroit term curriculum. Originally, the Detroit term Detroit term wasn't just supposed to be a curriculum. I was actually supposed to teach the class in person second semester this year. But because of COVID, that wasn't possible, unfortunately. But I'm going to still walk you guys through the curriculum and what I created that I hope one day a Roper teacher will be able to teach. So Detroit term is split up into three sections, six units, seven projects, and one experimental activity. So section one is on the history and culture of Detroit. And the first unit is an introduction to Detroit term. Basically, that day is really just sort of a day to get everyone's feels and what they're excited to find out about Detroit and also to test their knowledge. And that um, knowledge would be tested through the blind map assignment, which is where students will have to try and create a map of downtown Detroit to the best of their ability um, from what they just know off the top of their head. And I say downtown because Detroit as a city as a whole is huge and so downtown makes it easier. The next unit is History of Detroit where students would complete their fossil projects, portraits, buildings project, and neighborhood study. So a fo the fossil project is where you have to go and explore spe in a specific Detroit neighborhood um, and try to find something to do a project on. For example, when I was in New York, my fossil project was on one of the Chelsea Piers which I actually found out that almost every ship that was coming to that port had sank and a lot of interesting cool facts about it. But with that, in Detroit, that could be something as simple as um, a cobblestone on the street or an, uh, or an old telephone booth. Um, so the Fossils Project is a really fun way to start that off. Um, the next is your portraits project, and for portraits, that's where you actually, where students would actually have to interview multiple people who live in the city to try to get a city, per, like their perspective of living in Detroit. The buildings project is where students would select a building and they would have to do a presentation on it, but doing the complete history of the building. Um, and finally, neighborhood studies. So. How we did it at City Term is Neighborhood Studies was actually one of our last projects as a whole. But in my opinion, it made most sense for Neighborhood Studies to be in the um, History and Culture Unit because you would have just completed your Fossils, pro Portraits, built and Buildings project. And your Neighborhood Studies takes place in the neighborhood that you had for Fossils, Portraits, Buildings, and, and Buildings. So... Um, it depends on which one you get, but for example, someone's neighborhood could be Mexican Town and another group's could be Cork Town. Moving on, this uh, second section is Art and Artists in the City. And in that um, section, you have the unit of unconventional art and music before, during, and after Motown. So um, the unconventional art unit really talks about how, you know, you have so many of these local Detroit artists that really need to be featured and have incredible work. And so you go around the city exploring that artwork. Um, and then you actually find a gray area of the city. So what I mean by that is... Um, a city that doesn't ha a part of it that doesn't have a lot of art in it and you would virtually Im input your mural there um, and then the music before during and after Motown you would do your new Detroit artist project which focuses on finding a musical artist and then you would have to identify their sound um, and then um, basically you know pitch that artist to a the music producer, which is really just the teacher. And finally, the last section is about different perspectives on Detroit. 
in that unit you have that unit is news versus reality with an extension on gentrification um, and that talks about you would have to do an assignment where you once again get people's perspective of living in the city and then also um, comparing it to the news perspective in some creative way and um, then um, there's also the extension on gentrification, which just talks about how Detroit is being gentrified. And even though people feel like the gentrification process is moving really fast, it's actually one of the least gentrified cities in the U.S. currently. And then the Detroit term schedule. So Detroit term would meet every Wednesday, also known as Flex Day. And then the class would rotate between class at school and class in the city each week. So class time are learning days and uh, city trips are project days where you're exploring the city and getting um, inspiration for your project. So Detroit term grading, there are actually no grades at Detroit term. Detroit term is designed as a credit or no credit class, um, but students will get feedback on how to improve their visual, rhetorical, and observational skills. Most importantly, students will come out of Detroit term with a better understanding not only of the city around them, but of themselves. So at city term, I did finally get grades, but I feel like because this would be an elective, it shouldn't have grades. Anyways, so what are these skills really called? So first you have your goggles, and your goggles are where you're truly being aware of your perspective. For example, the lenses I look through are that I, when exploring Detroit, is that I am a white female teenage girl from Bloomfield Hills, not Detroit. I'm technically a tourist. Then you have wandering and wondering, which is truly allowing yourself to fully embrace an experience and just wander and walk around and explore a city and not know where you're going and be okay with not where you're going, but hope that you find something incredible in the end, which in most cases you do. The don't know, don't know zone, which is basically allowing yourself to be okay with the fact that you're not going to know what everything is. You might not even find out everything that you want to know about a certain mural or artist or... um building or restaurant, but that you're at least exploring, and that's important. Then you have reflection, which is always important, and Detroit term kids will do a lot because you will have to be writing in your city journal all the time. And finally, my favorite and most important are using knots. And you're probably like, what? Knots? But knots are when you're finding questions that you can't necessarily find the answer for, but you at least can explain your path and how you're trying to untangle it. So essentially, there's never going to be a right or wrong answer in Detroit term. It's all about your experiences and truly trying to gain the best experience and um, really exploring yourself and the city around you. So, okay, next I want to show you guys what an actual Detroit term class would look like. So each section, unit, project, and class will be different from each other. Today I'm talking to you about the Detroit Unconventional Art Unit and the projects that go with it. On the next slide, you will be taken on a trip to Detroit to see four important art sites in Detroit. The Burwood Wall, the Heidelberg Project, the Dequindor Cut, and the Belt. The Burwood Wall is an art project that celebrates black culture. The Heidelberg Project is... Um, an art project that turned a rundown um, neighborhood as a result of drugs into a positive and uplifting um, neighborhood in the community. The Dequindor Cut was an old railway um, station that was turned into a beautiful park. And the Belt, which is a little bit more of a gentrified art site, but still a favorite in the city. This city trip, students are supposed to be focusing on the different differences between the art and the locations. Students will also be looking out for four, for differences between the art done by international artists, national, and local art, artists. Also, students should be focusing on how rundown parts of a city can be reborn through art. 
meaning these gray zones where it was just a blank alley and how they turned it into a beautiful piece of art. So on the city trip, students should be gaining inspiration for their projects as well. That's pretty much the main goal of each city trip. So now um, I'm going to let you guys look at this for a couple seconds, which is um, what the Detroit art project would be and what students would be focusing on um, getting inspiration that day. They go and do the Detroit unconventional art um, city trip. Okay, so moving on to truly show you guys what a day in the life of, De of a Detroit term student was, I decided that I would actually teach a mock class even though I wasn't able to teach the full class. Um, just a little disclaimer, everyone featured in the video is completely vaccinated and when masks were required, we did wear masks. Detroit term is a time to truly embrace your surroundings and explore the unknown. Detroit term is a time to truly embrace your surroundings and explore the unknown just a few miles from your front door. So welcome to a day in the life of a Detroit term student. And what did you think of Detroit term well, for the I day? Thought, <laughs> it was great. I saw a lot of things, a lot of tourist attractions about Detroit that I've never seen before. I've been here for 17 years, like I just saw, I started to see new things and like it was really amazing to come down here and like take my goggles off for once and like see things differently. Pretty dope. 
I liked all the art, especially the graffiti. Pretty sweet. So, yeah, it's pretty fun. Were you inspired at all for your own art? A little bit, yeah. I took some pictures of some stuff that I liked. Awesome. So, I don't spend as much time down here as I should, so there's a lot of stuff that uh, I didn't know was here and a lot of pretty things. Um, they enjoyed it. I had fun. I very much enjoyed it. I looked at where I saw a lot of things that I really didn't know was here. And I appreciate uh, you taking us these locations. I don't know. It was a lot of fun. But they're turning like parts of Detroit that were necessarily like utilized into places uh, build up like artwork is really cool um, and I think it's a great way to bring back um, the kind of tourist industry back to the right? Hi, my name is Sydney Levy and this is my senior project, Trash In, an exploration of sustainability through fashion design. Before I start, I wanted to give a huge thanks to the advisor for my project, Sarah Mendez. Additionally, I wanted to thank all of the members of the Roper community who helped make my project possible by contributing and donating materials. So let's get started. Why did I choose to do this for my project? I've been passionate about the environment ever since I can remember. I grew up with the mindset that it is our responsibility to protect and care for our earth. Over time, this passion manifested itself in many different ways, whether it was planting a garden, leading recycling relays, or participating in protests, I've always found a way to work environmentalism into my life. As many of you probably know, at Roper, I've tried my very best to make our community a more sustainable place through things like Sierra Club and Earth Days, just to name a few. As I grew, my interests changed, but my passion for environmentalism did not. Over the first long quarantine, I realized, probably like many of you, um, that I had way too much time on my hands. So, consequently, I picked up a hobby, sewing. Sewing has always held a special place in my heart. My mother was a seamstress, my grandmother was a seamstress, even my great-grandmother was a seamstress. So I've always known how to sew, but I've never really had the time to practice. As I began to develop new skills and produce wearable items, I realized how much I loved it, enough to pursue an education in fashion and apparel design in the fall. The fashion industry is currently one of the world's largest polluters. It is the second largest consumer of our global water supply. It produces 10% of all carbon emissions and throws away more than 85% of all clothing and textiles. Until affordable, sustainable alternatives to fast fashion are found, the industry will only continue to grow and pollute on an even larger scale. As someone who loves fashion and clothes, these statistics inspired me to find a creative small-scale solution. So I was thinking instead of creating garments from new materials and producing unnecessary waste, why not use materials that are already available? So let's get into it. What did I actually do for my senior project? For my project, I chose to combine my two passions and create a collection of pieces made from unwanted materials like grocery bags, scrap fabric, and plastic water bottles. Though it only consists of three garments, I'm very proud of it nonetheless. I also wanted to include the Roper community in my project, so over the course I asked people to donate grocery bags and other materials for me to use. As a result, the materials used in my collection were all gathered from or donated by members of our community. So let's get into it. How did I do it? Let's just say a lot of steps went into this project. The first step was finding research and inspiration. The very first step that I took in designing my collection was research. In order to create pieces that I loved, I needed to understand what I was working with. So I spent the first few weeks of my project researching and reaching out to scrap material distributors in the Detroit area to get a better understanding of what resources I had available. 
Initially, I wanted to include materials like excess seat belts and leather scraps because of the excessive amount of waste produced by the car industry in Detroit. But unfortunately, they were not free and turned out to be quite costly. So instead, I spent time gathering free materials like plastic bags, excess fabric, and water bottles and looking for inspiration within them. Additionally, I did some research on what sustainable fashion collections existed already because a big part of this industry is pulling inspiration from pre-existing designs. Step two was sketching. The second step I took in designing my collection was sketching the possible garments I wanted to include. In order to decide what I wanted to include, I had to get them on a page in front of me. I knew that I wanted to have a variety of silhouettes and textures in the collection, so when sketching, I took the following criteria into account. How does the material move? How can they be combined? And perhaps most importantly, can I sew it? Now, I didn't end up actually sewing any of the sketches that you see here because I didn't gather enough of the materials, I didn't really know what I was doing, and also I didn't have enough time to create everything that I wanted to in my vision. But nonetheless, I'm proud of what I produced, which you will see in a later slide. Step three was planning. The third step I took in bringing my collection to life was planning how to actually do it. Before I could start sewing garments together, I had to visualize what each component looked like and how they were gonna fit together and what I wanted the final product to look like. So here are just some images of me pinning and sketching and cutting just to show you an idea of what planning a piece looks like. Step four was doing. The fourth and final step that I took in creating my garments was sewing them into actuality. Over the course of the year, I cut, pinned, knit, ironed, and sewed plastic bags and other scrap materials together to produce my collection. Here are just some images of the processes that I took. This is me sewing one of the layers of the dress that you'll see in the future slides together. Um, I had to do this 10 times. It was quite tedious, but yeah. Here is me pinning the bodice, um, yeah. So, let's get into it. The collection. The first garment in my collection is the Use Less Plastic Shoulder Bag. As I was working on the other pieces in my collection, I realized that I was producing a lot of unnecessary waste, so my solution was to turn it into stuffing for a quilted bag. Made from seven plastic bags and the scraps and a recycled bed sheet, this hand quilted shoulder bag is a literal and ironic representation of what the goal of my project is. The phrase use less plastic is stitched on the front of the bag as a reminder to decrease our unnecessary plastic consumption. The next two slides are going to be better pictures where you can see the details of the bag. Here's just a better image of the useless plastic stitching on the bag. The inspiration from this came purely from the irony of putting the phrase use less plastic on a shoulder bag made from plastic bags. Um, I really like the way that it turned out. I think that it sends a clear message as well as being a funny play on words. And then here's a better view of the quilting. So to get this effect, what I did was take a plastic bag and stuff it with all of the scraps from the other pieces in the collection and then close it and stitch the diagonals on. So each line that you see was hand stitched on and then the bag was put together. So each individual piece of the bag was quilted and then pieced together to create the final product. The second garment in my collection is the plastic princess dress. This puffy dress is made from about 80 plastic bags and a mesh fruit bag. It consists of 10 layers of material in the skirt where each layer is about four to seven bags, a corset bodice with an open back, and a ribbon made from shredded bags. In this piece, I wanted to show that elegance and beauty can be created from undesirable objects. I knew that I wanted to include a dress like this in my collection as soon as I thought of this idea for my project, and it turned out almost exactly as I had hoped. I'm not sure if you noticed, but the silhouette of this dress is similar to the gown I showed in the earlier slides of my sketches. 
as I was looking into the production of that dress, I realized that I had not enough time nor enough bags to create the magnificent effect of the full floor length gown. But nonetheless, I am very proud of how this piece turned out. It's giving me very much 80s prom and I love it. Here you can see different angles of the dress and here's a video to show movement. Here's a close up of the layers of the skirt, a view of the back, and just another picture to encompass the way that the skirt flows and moves. The third and final garment in my collection is the knit dress. This dress by far took me the most time and really didn't go as planned at all. Made from more than 100 plastic bags, this dress is hand knit and took way over 72 hours to create. The initial plan for this material was to create an oversized trench coat as seen in the previous slide with the sketches, but as I began working, I realized that I would need way more time and bags than I had available to me. This dress is made from three different knit panels that were woven together where each panel contains about 45 to 60 bags that had to have been cut up into strips, then tied together to create plarn or plastic yarn. I saw this technique used when I was researching pre-existing sustainable collections and immediately wanted to try it. I also wanted to note that the black under the garment you see is not part of the dress. There were just a lot of holes and I needed to put something under it. So the next two slides are close-ups of the material and all the other angles to show you the true dimension and texture of this dress. Here are just a few images featuring different angles to try and show you the variety of bags used in the dress as well as the difference in materials and textures. As you can see, there are a lot of little pieces sticking out and a lot of different colors and a lot of different textures going on, which is exactly what I wanted to go for. As I mentioned earlier in the slide about my sketching, I really wanted to try and encompass as many different textures and looks and silhouettes in this collection as possible. And I really think that this dress kind of pulled it all together. Here's a close up of what the knitting looks like. As you can see, there are a lot of different bags. So basically to get this look, I had to take the bags and cut them into loops and then tie them together and then knit them as you would normal yarn. Here's a view of the back. Um, it is tied up kind of like a corset dress, but there are no grommets. And also you can't really see that detail but I still think it looks pretty cool. That's all I have for you today. So thank you so, so much for your time. And I really hope you enjoyed my trash and collection. Now let's get on to the rest of the senior projects. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to my senior project presentation on building a baking business. If you know me, you know I love to bake. I've been baking for many, many years. I love everything about it, from the process itself to sharing what I make. Sharing what I make is especially important to me. My homeroom can attest to just how often I'd bring in homemade treats to share, but it was at least once a week. I usually made something new each time, too. Countless people have definitely seen me walking around school cradling a container of cookies or a box of brownies. So when it came time to design a senior project, it seemed only natural that I would build off of this passion and create a baking business. In building Twilight Baking, I went through numerous steps. This process was extensive and often took me into unfamiliar territory, but it was enjoyable through and through. Allow me to guide you chronologically through this project. To begin, let me take you back to August of 2020. I had to create my senior project proposal. As we are all well aware, things changed pretty significantly in March 2020. With that, my original idea shifted too. What I had first thought might be as simple as a recurring bake sale held at school suddenly increased in complexity, and this was not helped by spending my senior year as a full-time member of the Roper Home Learning Plan. I was still able to propose that my project would involve starting a business, I'd just have to figure out the details along the way. So, fall of 2020 became my brainstorming time. One of the significant challenges of this project was trying to forecast the future. 
And that led to a lot of hypotheticals. We just didn't know what the COVID-19 climate would be in the spring. Would I be allowed at the school? Would anyone want to order? So I spent the fall planning different contingencies. Additionally, I came up with the name and look at this part actually. I decided upon the name Twilight Baking because Twilight is both my favorite time of day and the time when I usually bake. Being in high school, I was usually only free to bake in the evenings after school. Of course, now as a home learner, I could be baking literally any time during the day and no one would know, but we won't talk about that. Anyway, those first few months of planning went by without any major updates. We knew the sale would be in second semester in spring, but had yet to set a date. So I continued on with my other responsibilities, keeping Twilight Baking in the back of my mind. And then it was suddenly January, and I realized this year was going by faster than I thought it would. It was ultra important to get this show on the road. After many date ideas, like mid-February, early March, late March, we settled on early April. Specifically, the website would open the week of March 15th, and order pickup would be on April 9th and 10th. This was a good time. It was before the end of the year began to pick up and get busy, but in the window to have warm enough weather where we could do an outside pickup. With those solid dates in mind, the pace of the project began to pick up. To stay organized throughout this lengthy process, I took many notes. That was how I kept track of what needed to be done or what we planned. Looking back, this page is fairly indecipherable but they served beautifully in keeping all the different aspects of this project under control. This particular page happens to be from around February, and if you look at the top of the page, you can see one of the menu ideas I was playing around with. See, now that the dates were scheduled, I realized I can't hold a bake sale without things to sell, and it took me a bit of time to decide what my actual product would be. There were endless options, so many delicious things, Whatever I choose, I had to remember three key things. I needed to be able to make a high volume of it. It needed to be fairly low effort in order to keep the price reasonable and time invested low. And it had to be delicious. That pretty much knocked out any sort of bread out of the running. Cookies and bars checked all those boxes though. Luckily for me, I have a few signature desserts. Going through my favorite recipes turned out to be perfect. And in no time at all, I had a menu. Molasses cookies are my favorite cookies, chocolate chip cookies are a classic, and brown butter brown sugar cookies have been a hit with anyone who's ever tried one. Then, in addition to cookies, I decided some rich and moist frosted chocolate brownies would be delightful, snickerdoodle bars would appeal to those who want a little less chocolate, and our family favorite vegan and gluten-free brownies would round out the list. I tested these recipes, which was very exciting for my family as designated taste testers. When these things all proved to be delicious, it was time to try my hand at food photography, so they looked as fabulous as they tasted. Now, some of you may know I enjoy film photography, but exploring food photography was, like many things in this project, new to me. Luckily, I think I did okay. Now that I had a menu, we needed a way for people to actually be able to order. A website checked all the boxes, as it would provide a platform to view the products, manage inventory, and exchange payment. But it was a complicated step, as I had never designed a website before, and I wanted it to be both aesthetically pleasing and user-friendly. Creating the product listings was tricky at first. Trying to get the options for people to choose a pickup date took some figuring out. Eventually, we were able to run a test purchase, and it went through. This was the beginning of the stage where the actual reality of the project began to set in. Finally, after months of planning, I had this actual result. However, I wasn't finished yet. It was time to advertise. I wanted people to order, so I had to get the word out somehow. Honestly, this wasn't too hard. The Roper community is sort of a captive audience, so I designed a poster and requested it be sent out in the school newsletter and posted on social media. Additionally, I bravely left my home learning safe haven and descended upon the upper school building to hang posters in the halls. I enjoyed these steps. Seeing Twilight Baking spread on social media and the physical reality of the flyers in the school seemed like a major step towards completion. This was going to happen. So, with Twilight Baking out in the world and the website up and running, the only thing left to do was to see if anyone would order.
the entire website sold out after just two and a half days. 38 orders, equivalent to 216 cookies, 36 brownies, 24 snickerdoodle bars, and 18 vegan brownies. I continued to get messages like, is there anything left to purchase? And oh no, did I miss my chance to order? Though I wanted so badly to add more products to the website so everyone who wanted to could buy, the sheer amount of products I already had to bake brought me back to reality. And good thing I didn't increase the inventory. I could already tell that the baking would take days, and the amount of ingredients alone was more than anything I'd ever bought before. I wrote out all the ingredients I would need for each recipe and created a mega grocery list. Highlights from this list include 22 cups of powdered sugar, 31 eggs, and 12 bars of chocolate. After a trip to buy the supplies, I was really excited. The sheer quantity of items I was about to make was mind-blowing. While I have sold baked goods in the past, the magnitude of this undertaking was unparalleled. Going from selling a dozen birthday cupcakes or a box of holiday cookies to offering hundreds of desserts was a major leap, but I was ready. I took inventory of all the trays, bowls, spatulas, pans, measuring utensils, and anything else I would possibly need, and determined the proper order to do things in. The most challenging aspect was timing. Getting items cooled off before packing them up or putting frosting on would be essential. Additionally, I'd have to make sure I wouldn't run out of time. There's a hard deadline of Friday afternoon with no excuses. So I wrote out a schedule. Something I'll always remember from sixth grade life skills class with Linda Pence is that prep work is essential. I plan to chop the 48 ounces of chocolate I'd need and prepare everything else on Wednesday afternoon, then bake the chocolate chip cookies on Wednesday night. Thursday, I woke up and got straight to work on the brown butter brown sugar cookies. After that, it was time to bake three pans of brownies, two pans of snickerdoodle bars, and two batches of vegan brownies. After falling into a deep sleep, my alarm jolted me awake on Friday morning to begin the molasses cookies. Then I attempted to whip up three quarts of frosting in a three and a half quart mixer bowl. I was successful, barely, and began to frost the brownies, then the snickerdoodle bars, then the vegan brownies. And somehow, I had baked everything, and it all went smoothly. However, at this point, it was around 11 a.m. The delivery van, a.k.a. my dad's car, would arrive around 11.15, and I had to get all of this stuff packaged up. It was no good just sitting on my counters. Thus began the frenzy of cutting trays of bars into equal pieces, portioning out orders, and packing them into boxes. It took a little trial and error to determine the most space-efficient way to pack these things, but I got the hang of it pretty quickly. With the help of my mom, we got it done just in time. After loading everything into the car, I began to get nervous. Funnily enough, I was calm throughout the whole baking process, arguably the time where I had the most to lose, but super nervous when it was actually time to hand out the orders. Well, there was no going back now. So we arrived at the school and set up the Twilight Baking order table. An occurrence I did not anticipate was that people would be coming up and hoping they could buy things right then and there. I hated to be the bearer of bad news, but I had to tell them that these items were all spoken for. Anyway, after two fun hours of handing out orders and speaking with people I hadn't seen in months, we'd completed day one of pickups. On Saturday, April 10th, day two, I enjoyed sleeping in and not having to bake anything. At noon, we headed right back to school to hopefully hand out the rest of the orders, and it was another successful day. The weather was lovely, and again, we had a super fun time. After the completion of the pickup times, 33 out of 38 orders were picked up and the rest were delivered just so that everyone could get their hands on their purchase. When we returned home on Saturday afternoon, all I wanted to do was lie down on the couch and never move again. I did lie down, but I had homework to do, so I had to get up eventually. Fortunately, the feeling of victory from successfully completing what I had set out to do propelled me through the rest of the weekend. Now, this was supposed to be a business venture. Was it profitable? You bet. There were external costs, like the website fee, cost of materials and ingredients. So many ingredients. But after a little bit of math, the figure I earned was roughly $344. So yeah, that's pretty incredible. 
But to me, the most amazing part of this project has been seeing the support from the Roper community. Even after the completion of the sale, I continued to get messages praising the desserts, which was so meaningful to me. I've always loved to bake, but hearing confirmation that what I baked was actually good, and confirmation from people who aren't my family, was so meaningful. Thank you to everyone who ordered. And thinking of those who couldn't order, a neat thing about this project is that it can be run again now that it's established. Now I'm not making any promises, I'm just saying this isn't the last for Twilight Baking. If I were to hold another sale, I have a few things I would change based off what I learned. Or rather, not change, but improve. I'd want to simplify the pickup times, communicate a bit more with customers, and branch out what baked goods I'd offer. A rotating menu or changing out a few items here and there could be fun. There's a lot that can be explored. A question that stuck in my mind throughout this process was, what if I, no one orders? This was somewhat of a risky project after all. There was no guarantee of selling anything. We had originally discussed a two week period for orders to be placed in with the possibility of extending that if there were still products available. As we've discussed, we were quite wrong. There were practical lessons and times where I stepped out of my comfort zone along the way, like figuring out the product photography, designing a website, and doing math. I could have done without the math part, but at the end of the day, all of the risks were well worth the reward. The original goal of this project, project, exploring how to turn a hobby into a full-fledged business, was met and exceeded. This worked out beyond my wildest dreams. But of course, this wouldn't have happened without support and guidance from my advisor, Kelly McDowell, willingness of my family to help, and the willingness of the community to purchase. Everyone has contributed to the success of Twilight Baking, and I am so grateful. All in all, this was the best way I could have imagined to close off seven years of baking for the Roper Upper School community, by making people pay for things I used to give them for free. I hope you've enjoyed, or at least tolerated me, guiding you through the journey of Twilight Baking. Thank you. Hi, my name is Charlotte Silverstein, and for my senior project, I taught an art class. Doing a senior project has always been in the back of my mind. I've gone to many a senior project night to support friends or because I was part of a production. Then this year, I realized that being a senior had snuck up on me, and it was time to figure out what I was going to do. I knew I wanted to do something involving art, as it has always been one of my favorite activities, as long as I can remember. So I asked Sarah Mendez to be my advisor as I continued to mull over all of the possibilities of what this project could be. We talked and decided that we could combine my budding interest in teaching and my interest in art into teaching an art class. This was a good start, but now I had to decide what this art class was going to be, what, about what subject, what medium, and who I was going to teach. After thinking it over and talking to my friends and families for weeks, inspiration struck, where it always does, in the shower. While I was working on conditioning my hair, I was thinking about my forensic speech I had been working on. Last year, I started writing an info on deep sea life, and I had just started taking it to tournaments when COVID hit and put the entire project on pause. This year, I got to pick that speech back up and continue where I left off rekindling my interest in deep sea and what lurks beneath it. This speech was the inspiration for what my class became. I decided to combine my interests and started planning an elective that would teach fourth and fifth graders about the ocean through creative art projects. Before I could get to any of that though, I would need to do some planning. I had no idea what it would take to teach a class of my own let alone during a global pandemic. I reached out to the new expert on the topic, Shoshana, the lower school art teacher, who was able to give me some very important information. Number one is that all art electives at the lower school were being taught virtually, even for the kids in in-person school, and that all supplies would need to be provided. Shoshana invited me to sit in on some of her classes to get a first-hand experience of what it would be like. I saw that there was definitely some new challenges. 
kids would have to go and find supplies they brought from home, which could cause them to miss instructions. There was also the challenge that some kids seemed to live inside of a craft store, while others only had the supplies you gave them. So you would have to figure out how to be flexible to both sides of the spectrum. The class was also a lot of fun and was confirmation that this is what I wanted to do. With my new knowledge, I set off planning for my class. I had ambitious ideas about an eight week, once a week extracurricular where we did six different projects. I bounced ideas off my friends and family to help pick out the finalized project ideas. I made a list of all of the different supplies I would need and where I would be get them, so I was able to write up a final budget for how many kids I expected to get. When the budget was approved, I spent the weekend with my dad driving around to two different Michaels, a Gordon Food Service, and a Home Depot to collect all of the supplies I needed individual supply bags, complete with everything they could possibly need to complete my projects. I worked until I was an envelope-making master and my hands were sore from squeezing paint bottles. After remembering from visiting Shoshana's class how hard it was to make sure that everyone knew what was going on, I created fun fun rainbow instruction sheets that had all the information on what we were doing, as well as some inspiration pics and facts about whatever the project was on. Like for the one day where we painted microorganisms, I gave them a little overview on what they were before we painted them. Then with the help of my dad and brother, we packaged all the instruction sheets into labeled envelopes, squeezed all of, all of the supplies into the car, and dropped them off at the lower school for the kids to pick up before our first class. I was giddy with nervous excitement before our first class. I crossed my fingers that I would be able to do it on my own, but to my relief, it was a blast. The kids had so much fun opening their day one envelopes and working hard on creating the pins. They told me about their favorite candies and fun facts about the ocean. They showed me their dogs and explained why Godzilla is the coolest sea creature to ever live. At the end of the first day, one of the kids wrote to message me that this is the best class ever. All of our classes can continue to be so much fun and I looked forward to them all week. That doesn't mean everything went completely as expected. I planned projects that I thought would take the kids about 40 minutes to do so that we wouldn't be rushed and so there would be time for kids to come in late. I wanted there to be some wiggle room. The challenge came when some kids would take all 40 minutes to complete their projects and others would only take 15. I tried to think of creative ways to keep them working, like maybe their clay sculpture of a creature should have a baby or some sculpted food. But we still ended up with some time where kids were totally done with 30 minutes left in class, so I would get taken on fun tours of their pets or American Girl doll setups. There were also some moments where even though I thought my project was very clear, the kids would have their own ideas. For example, what I thought was a super cool paint a microorganism project, a lot of kids decided it was actually a paint a blue gradient project. There were also some issues with the materials. I had bought a tub of clay as one of the materials, and we quickly realized the clay had a bad habit of completely self-destructing if you were not super good at sticking it together and not being super gentle, which is not a fourth or fifth grader specialty. But other than the couple of kerfuffles, everything went pretty well. You could really tell all of the kids were super excited about the projects and the subject matter. One day I was supposed to have class, but an unexpected family emergency happened and I wasn't able to make it. I came back the next week expecting everyone to be a week behind schedule. But they had all come together it, during my absence and finished up the day's project all on their own. You could tell they were really excited.
for the eighth week of class, we all got together one last time and had a last hurrah to say goodbye. I still miss my kids. Thursdays have felt empty without them. I couldn't have imagined at the beginning of the year how much I would have enjoyed this whole project. It has helped me figure out what I want to do for my future and taught me so many valuable lessons along the way. I will leave you with a text I sent to my friend Lee Must while I was getting ready to teach my class that really sums up my whole experience. I have created the my dream class from elementary school, but now I am not taking it, I am teaching it, and I have never been more excited. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Hannah Wise. This is my senior project, and it is the mental health plan for Roper. So to provide some introduction and background, this project is really close to me. I have worked to advocate for mental health resources throughout my time at Roper, and I also started You Matter Weekend Club at Roper. So to start off the project, I sent out a survey to all middle and high school students as well as faculty um, with some questions about different resources, as well as just how they feel about the general mental health culture at Roper. Um, I've also worked with Ray and Young to set realistic goals for us to achieve as a community as well as for the administration throughout the phased plan. So the plan goes from phase one being the easiest to implement in terms of time and money to phase four being the most difficult. So here we are going to go in the survey results. Um, this is from the middle school and high school survey. They tend to align with the faculty view, so it's just going to be the results from the middle and high school. So I got about 229 responses, majority of them being from high school students. So the first question I asked is, it is easy to communicate um, to Roper faculty about mental health problems. And I asked them from, to rank from one being, no, it's not easy at all, to five being, it's very easy. And as you can see, the general consensus was about a three. So not great, but not awful, kind of neutral. Um, the second question I asked was, I would like an optional mental health training available once a year. And majority of people, the largest amount we got was a 5, 26.7%. Um, so that kind of gave a general consensus that, yeah, this is something we should implement. Um, the next question was, it would be helpful to have late starts on Wednesdays where teachers are available for office hours an hour before, before school starts. And as you can see, that got an overwhelming majority of 52.4% saying, yes, they would want that. Um, and then it, I would benefit from having a wellness space similar to what Rayanne provides during finals week, but year round. Um, the largest percent we got was a five, 28.9%. And the general consensus was from three to five. That was the greatest um, percentage of groups. So general consensus is, yeah, that's something we should also implement. Um, and I'll go into more of what the wellness space is once we get into the recommendations. And I formatted the survey a little wacky at first, so excuse the different answers. I asked if a crisis week would be helpful. Um, again, I can go into that once we go into the recommendations and 86.2% of people said yes. So overwhelmingly majority, yes, that's something to implement. So the first thing I wanna go into is the definition of mental health for community guidelines. Um, and I think that's something that we as a Roper community kind of lack in talking about and kind of lack in having because a lot of times we talk about mental health, but mental health is a really umbrella, it's an umbrella term, it's really all encompassing. So this is for us to implement into the community guidelines as defined by the World Health Organization. Mental health is a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Community, and I think that's really fitting for Roper. Um, now we're going to go into phase one recommendations. So the first one is a crisis week in every class. So Susanna Nichols kind of started this in her classes. So basically what it is, is you email your teacher, say, hey, I'm using my crisis week, and you get a one week extension on the assignment. Um, and as I said in the entire document I have, um, this is just the PowerPoint, but I have an entire written document. Um, teachers can decide if they would like to communicate with students, if a student says, hey, I need more than a week, if they're going to deduct late points or not. Um, but I think it's something really important to implement. Um, I'm going to keep it brief. I won't go into the why, what. I think it's kind of, um, you can assume why kids need that. Um, so two, 
Two excused mental health days for students and teachers. So I know that we have a certain number of excused absences, but I think having those designated mental health absences are important for people to know that Roper prioritizes their students' mental health. Um, Three, two excused assignments per semester in every class. This does not mean excused tests or excused projects. It's really up to the teacher to determine, but it mostly means homework assignments. So let's say someone was to take their mental health day. It's recommended that you use the excused assignments in tandem so that you can just have that day to kind of decompress. Um, recommendation four is have mental health programming bi-monthly, and this kind of goes hand in hand with recommendation six, um, have a student administrative mental health liaison, which I will get into in a minute. Um, but this kind of starts creating a culture of sparking conversations and understanding within the Roper community. Um, number five, have a centralized calendar for all projects and tests. So this is something for teachers to look at. They can upload their test and project due dates. And let's say I had a statistics test on Friday and I was about to have an AP English paper due, but Kelly was to look at the calendar and says, oh, I know a lot of my students take AP to statistics. I'm going to move the due date for this paper. That's just kind of one way to cut down on some stresses um, when projects and tests can be overloaded onto one day. And then six, have a student administrative mental health liaison. So this is a position I have proposed to add to student government. Um, basically, it's someone who kind of represents the mental health interest for the student body. They would meet with Karen and David as needed. I suggested minimum being once a month. Um, they would help support that mental health programming that's bi-monthly um, in conjunction with You Matter Club as the sole purpose of You Matter Club is to plan, you know, mental health programming. Um, and the reason I suggested it for student government is because student government is a fixture at Roper. It is something that won't go away no matter what. Um, so having that kind of position there secured and cemented into the community, I think, is important. So now we will move on to phase two. So the first recommendation for phase two is Wednesday late starts. And there were a few ways that we could structure this. This could be a time to kind of have... Um, a chance to meet with teachers because I know, for example, Groves High School, they have an X block on Tuesdays where they start late and students can go and schedule time to meet with their teachers. This could also just be a late start for both students and teachers. No meetings, no office hours, nothing like that. Just a time to kind of have that morning and take it slow. Um, the second suggestion is have both study halls and free blocks. So a lot of times we hear like, oh, I use my free blocks to socialize. Um, and go off campus. So I think this distinction is important because you're kind of being held accountable when you sign up for study halls to get your work done and you don't really have an excuse. And as someone who procrastinates a lot, I personally would benefit from that and I think a lot of other Roper students would too. Um, the third recommendation is restructure mental health and health classes. So what I mean by that is to include a time management unit, specifically in the middle school health classes, and then have a mental health professional teach the mental health units in both middle and high school. Because we have great teachers, but they're not mental health professionals, and mental health professionals can provide a different outlook and a different approach to these mental health units. Um, the fourth recommendation is provide mental health training to students and teachers. So there's programs such as Safe Talk, which is suicide prevention. There are other programs um, that, you know, Roper could go through, and I'm sure Brayan has some connections to those. Um, and in the survey for the teachers, you know, they said sometimes they don't really know how to deal with things. And then also students, um, as I referenced before, said that they would benefit from having the optional mental health training. Um, so I think it's definitely something to include. And then the fifth recommendation is teacher socialization events. That's something I got um, was something that teachers would like from the faculty survey I sent out. And I know it's been harder because of COVID, so definitely no penalties for that this year. But I think just kind of having a time beyond, you know, the once or twice when we do the lunches for teachers um, is important to them because a lot of times um, faculty mental health is overlooked. So now we will move on to phase three. Phase three and four, the recommendations are kind of brief. Um, recommendation one is a wellness space. So I referenced that before. So during midterms and final week, finals week, Rayanne um, made a wellness space. And what it is, is it's just kind of a space to slow down. Because I know we have the library where people have quiet study. And then we have the commons where people can hang out with their friends. But we don't have a space where people can just slow down, not worry about their schoolwork, and just kind of take a break in the middle of the day. 
So the wellness space can include a few different things, comfortable furniture, aromatherapy, things like that. Just a place for students to kind of relax and have a way to break up their day. And then the second recommendation is offer both projects and exams during midterms and finals week. So I know a lot of kids that take that get test taking anxiety and also just don't feel like they benefit from taking tests. They, you know, they memorize the information and then they just regurgitate it for the exam. So by offering projects, not only has product based learning been proven to show more meaningful and in depth way of studying. Um, it kind of alleviates the pressure because there are some students that prefer doing projects. There are some students that prefer taking tests. So by offering both of these, we are accommodating both types of students. Phase four. So these recommendations, again, are brief, but the first is being a mental health administrative position. So um, this is someone who would have a position um within the administration and their sole purpose would be to look at um, decisions being made from a mental health perspective and whether we want that to be one of the part-time counselors as I will reference as the next suggestion um, is you know up to the administration to decide but just having someone who can really look at you know scheduling who can look at um, different things the administration kind of makes decisions on from solely a mental health perspective is really important. And then hire two part-time counselors, one of which being male. So number one, we have grades 6 through 12. Um, and it is a lot for one part-time counselor to try to handle all of that in addition to kind of provide mental health um, advice to the administration when making decisions. Um, so by having two, we can really make sure the entire community is supported. And then I said one of which being male because the another piece of feedback I got from the student survey is that there are males who would like to talk to a counselor, but they feel more comfortable talking to a male, which is totally understandable. So I think by offering that opportunity, we are really making sure that mental health resources are available to everyone. So those are all the recommendations I have. We are now going to just move into a brief, how is this going to happen? So I already had a meeting with Karen and David. Um, and we decided I'm going to write a brief kind of summary to present for them to kind of give to the board. And then I'm also going to go to a faculty meeting to present to them and see if we can get the crisis week and everything from phase one approved for next year. Um, I also am working with Zion Johnson, who's the moderator of student government, to get the mental health um, administrative liaison position implemented for next year as well. Um, I'm also hoping to get someone to carry on my project for next year and really make sure these things are implemented. And then I also um, have two great co-presidents, Matteo Papadopoulos and Bella Vartanian, um, who are going to carry on You Matter for next year. So there are definitely ways this is going to carry on. I'm not sure what it's going to look like, but I think it's important to always continuously have those mental health kind of, you know, resources. So I really appreciate you listening to my senior project and I hope maybe this gave you a different perspective to look at and just some food for thought.